Hi, it's Dwyer, dwyercrime.blog. Also, always 1776.com. Today is July 18th, 2023. Let's talk about a murder case involving a woman, Rebecca Fenton, who appeared on Pierce Morgan's show, was interviewed by Pierce, and sounded believable. Right? She's in prison for murder. She has an explanation for everything. Even Pierce, who can be tough on some of his interviewees, thought that there was a possibility that Rebecca Fenton was innocent. Let's talk about the case. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, Pierce Morgan has a show where he visits people in jail who have been convicted of committing terrible crimes. I believe his real game is to scare us by showing us the thought process of the convicted. Now, as the inmate recounts the events that landed them in prison, in this case, convicted of murder, there is always a twist in the narrative where the inmate goes from talking about being upset with the murder victim to trying to justify participating in the murder. Right? Others, as is the case here, will claim innocence. If you recall the great TV detective series with Peter Falk called Columbo, well, in that series, Lieutenant Columbo would ask the person he suspected of committing the crime how they would explain the evidence that seems to suggest their criminal involvement. On Pierce Morgan's show, why it's compelling television is that he creates the same dynamic. He will ask an inmate who is claiming that they did not do the murder how they would explain the most damaging evidence against them. And sometimes he gets answers. Now, in my opinion, the best inmate interviewee on the Pierce Morgan series is Rebecca Fenton. She was a woman who, in her late 30s, married a man who was a little bit more than a decade older than her, named Larry Fenton. The couple met in a gym. Both of them valued physical fitness. Larry was a pharmaceutical salesman who was financially successful and who had bought a house in Florida. After marriage, he financially supported both he and his wife, Rebecca. Now, according to Rebecca, a major moment that took place while she was dating Larry came when she admitted to Larry that she had been a call girl in the past. Larry did not reject her. The two of them, according to Rebecca, were in love and moved forward with their relationship, which progressed quickly. The couple got married less than a year after initially meeting. Now, according to Rebecca, it was a happy marriage. They lived in Larry's Florida home, which consisted of more than one building. As they both valued fitness, Larry built a gym in a building detached from the house. Rebecca admits that Larry treated her like a royal princess. Importantly, and this is very important and it's different from other cases. This is not a case where the convicted murderer is claiming she was mistreated or that her husband was even neglectful. Rebecca is claiming the opposite, that she 
was treated like a queen, that Larry provided for her financially, that she had all she could ever want and was living a comfortable life that exceeded her expectations. All of that ends on Super Bowl Sunday of 2008 when Larry is murdered in the family home by the front door, which is adjacent to the living room, right? As Rebecca, at least according to Rebecca, was working out in the gym in the adjacent building. Now, the couple had been together roughly three years. Larry had been shot four times, including shots to his back. Police theorized that Larry was being shot while he was making a move toward the front door to leave the building, and that he ultimately fell and succumbed to his injuries. It was a bloody scene, right? The kind of bloody scene that you get when someone's been shot four times, right? Now let's pivot right here. I believe Rebecca did the crime and was rightfully convicted. What fascinates me about this case is that I believe Rebecca, who is very well-spoken and who raises doubts in Piers Morgan's mind as to whether or not she did the crime, I believe Rebecca is a psychopath who lacks a real emotional connection to the people around her. Importantly, she is organized, she's calm, and she's rehearsed. She has an answer for everything, at least she does now. She knows how to work an audience and is an expert at turning on emotional displays that include a cracked voice and crying when she needs to have emotion. She has thought things out to the point where she was able to cover some of her tracks. For example, the police tested her hands for gunpowder residue. The tests came back negative. And this was for a shooting that involved four gunshots. I believe Rebecca is organized and rehearsed enough to have worn gloves during the shooting. What trips her up, in my opinion, is riveting. Psychopaths don't think like the rest of us. As they lack empathy and a real emotional connection for other people, Reality to them, in my opinion, is like acting on a TV show, right? There is no real emotional attachment or connection to anyone. Life becomes all about role play. When they plan for and commit a major crime, such as this one, they can't frame it in a way that will fool people with empathy because they don't know how people with empathy think. Their emotional affect is going to be off. The things they do are going to be unusual. They are so outside of the normal human thought process that they won't be able to set up the murder in a way that empathetic humans can fully understand. Such is the case here. According to Rebecca, she worked out in the detached building for approximately two hours. When she returned to the main house, she finds her husband Larry motionless on the floor in the foyer by the front door. He is lying in a pool of blood, according to her. It looked like there had been a struggle and that he was a victim of a burglary. Simply put, 
She believes an armed intruder snuck into the house and shot her husband from behind four times. But here is where, in my opinion, her psychopathic thought process betrays her. She told the police that she then checked her husband's pulse to see if he was still alive. She claims she didn't know how to do so properly, so she could not tell. Now, I believe a normal, empathetic person would have been devastated and would have panicked. The love of your life, your spouse, is bleeding on the floor, and you can't tell whether or not he is still alive. In addition, he had back injuries. He's bleeding, caused by someone else an intruder who might still be in the house. That's Rebecca's story. Now, I believe a normal person would have run out of the house. Rebecca claims she had a cell phone in her car. I believe a normal person would have tried to get to that cell phone as quickly as possible so she could call 911. This is a medical emergency. Call 911 for medical attention and police attention. Do so as soon as possible to maximize whatever chance your husband has of surviving. Right? Another reaction, in my opinion, would have been to run to a neighbor's house have that neighbor call 911. Warn that neighbor that there might be an intruder in the house and lock the door, protect the kids, shut the window. Now keep in mind, Larry's body is right by the front door. Finds it. Leaving the building is right in front of her. Now, if a loved one is shot and bleeding to death in your home and you discover the body right by the front door, I believe most of us would run out of the house. But psychopaths don't know that. They have lived in an imaginary life in a bubble where they are emotionally detached from the people around them. In planning a murder like this, I believe psychopaths are at a disadvantage because they simply don't know how a normal person would react. I believe they get caught up in their own narrative that involves the staging of the crime. It's a narrative they have worked hard on. Their focus is on convincing people that their narrative is true. It's not on whether the narrative involves normal emotional reactions. So Rebecca Fenton claims that after she finds her husband by the front door bleeding profusely, and after being unsuccessful in trying to take his pulse, she claims that she then went upstairs to look around to make sure that the house hasn't been burglarized. That's her thought process. You have a live person bleeding to death on the floor. You're thinking about your belongings. You're thinking about your assets. Have we been robbed? Not, how do I save my husband's life? Not, let me immediately get help. Not, somebody just shot my husband. There might be not just an intruder, but an intruder who's a murderer in the house. Let me get out of the house right now, in part, to save myself. No, her story is that she went upstairs 
to see if they had been burglarized and noticed some drawers had been pulled out. She comes back downstairs. To her, this is normal. She tries to take her husband's pulse a second time, according to her. She still can't tell whether or not he's alive. It is then that she leaves the building to call 911. Now, Rebecca, being a psychopath, hasn't thought about certain things. Let's just say that Rebecca is apparently not afraid of running into a dangerous burglar who has already shot her husband. Let's just say she can't figure out at all how a normal person would react in that situation. Everything is conceptual. Nothing is actual for her because she's a psychopath. She also overlooked what the forensic evidence would show. Right? She has her lies figured out. She's just unsure about what she has to lie about. So the crime scene is bloody. Rebecca claims that she checked her husband's pulse twice. Yet there is no blood on her. None. In my mind, this is consistent with her passing the gun residue test because it shows she may have been wearing gloves if you believe that she checked her husband's pulse at all. I don't believe she did because there are no footprints in the blood around her husband's body. In fact, the blood around her husband's body is undisturbed. How does Rebecca check her husband's pulse twice without getting any of his blood on her and without getting any footprints in the blood around her husband. Rebecca makes other mistakes that an emotionally detached person would make in furtherance of trying to make this look like a burglary. Rebecca takes her husband's car, which is in the driveway. When the cops show up, her husband's Jeep is missing. Now let's ask ourselves a question. Would a burglar who has just shot and killed someone in this suburb want to then be seen driving the victim's car in the neighborhood right after the murder? Now we're regular people. We're not criminal masterminds, but let's ask another question. If a burglar planned to burglarize a suburban home, wouldn't they need transportation to travel to the home? Are burglars looking for houses that have cars in the driveway and people at home on Super Bowl Sunday? Or would a burglar prefer to burglarize the house when no one's home and the possibility of resistance is low. I would argue, and again, I'm not a criminal mastermind, but I believe this is how most people think. I would argue that burglars are looking for the least resistance possible. I don't believe burglars even want to deal with pets. In other words, a burglar sees a house, says, hey, this looks like a house that might have some assets. As they're coming up to the house, if they hear a dog barking from inside the house, that's going to discourage the burglar. Right? Burglars are supposed to have thought this out. If they are walking up to the house, they see cars in the driveway, they break into the house, some adult male is in the living room watching the pregame for the Super Bowl. I believe 
that most burglars are then going to say, hey, I'm in the wrong house, have some ready-made excuse, and hightail it out of there. Right? I'm guessing the presence of Larry's car in the driveway would discourage most burglars. I'm guessing even an inattentive burglar would notice the car in the driveway because I believe they're looking to see which houses are empty and which houses are occupied. Let's go further. Even if the burglar overlooks the car in the driveway, enters the house, let's say Larry is in the bathroom. So even though the TV's on and he's planning on watching the Super Bowl and he's all set, that's how his wife left him. Let's say I'm a burglar and I'm in the house and Larry has gone to the bathroom. He doesn't happen to be in the living room. Well, when Larry comes back out of the bathroom and will overlook the fact that his wife is on the premises. So this is the bold burglar who doesn't see anyone, even though someone else is actually there. It's not one adult, it's two adults there. But let's say we're in the main house. We're in the main house. And I stumble on Larry in Larry's living room. Well, just to understand, Larry then turns and starts running toward the front door. If I'm a burglar, am I not grateful for that? He's killed right before the front door. In my mind, am I not thinking, great, this guy's running away. Let me get the hell out of here now. That guy's probably running away to contact law enforcement. This is a botched burglary. I thought this would be a walk in the park. Instead, I find out an adult is home and he's running away. Why would a burglar interested in just grabbing a few items, burglarizing a house, and then being on his way. Why would a burglar shoot the house occupant who's running out of the house four times? Four times, not, not once, four times. When the burglar already is safe because the occupant's running away. Let me say this too. What burglar shows up on foot to commit a burglary of a suburban home? Right, folks, here there's no evidence that the burglar shows up on a bike. There's no evidence that someone dropped off the burglar. And would any group of burglars participate in a burglary where you're dropping off the burglar on a Super Bowl Sunday? Right, just to understand, we're supposed to believe that the burglar uses Larry's car to get away from the burglary. Who could plan for that? Let's say I enter the house and I rob the place. If Larry's not home, why would his car keys be home? If that was the burglar's plan. How do I know I'll be able to start the car in the driveway? How do I know the car in the driveway doesn't have a car alarm? So let's say I succeed in getting into this house, robbing the house, that's successful. I'm then leaving, and my plan is to drive the victim's, excuse me, the uh, occupant's car away from the murder scene. How do I know that everything isn't going to fall apart when a car alarm goes off? Suddenly the neighbors are looking out the window, and here I am looking like Santa with a big bag of items that I'm stealing. People are getting Woken, I'm there in the driveway because this is my plan, to rob the car in the driveway, 
without a key. Even if I stumble into the key in the house, which is unlikely if people are away from home, even if I stumble into a car key, you know, there are many cars where if you don't know what button to push on the car key, the alarm's going to go off. Right? Do you think for a second that that was the burglar's plan? To drive Larry's car away from the crime scene? It doesn't make sense. You would instantly create a whole group of witnesses, neighbors, hearing the car alarm go off that you couldn't stop from going off. Worse yet, if the idea of leaving the crime scene using the car in the driveway went awry, what was this burglar's next move? To walk down the street with a sack of stolen goods? It doesn't make sense. We're hearing that Larry's laptop was stolen and other items, right? It doesn't make sense that a burglar would show up, would grab enough items so that the burglary is cost justified, right? The benefit is worth the risk of a prison stay, of incarceration, and that the burglar's plan on leaving the scene would be to take the car in the driveway a car to which the burglar supposedly wouldn't have had a key. Well, just understand, since she's a psychopath, Rebecca Fenton hadn't thought about any of this. Again, human beings and relationships are just concepts to psychopaths. They're not emotionally invested. They don't feel the shared goodwill, right? In planning the crime, she could not put herself in the position of the burglar. She wasn't thinking of how an empathetic burglar, as preposterous as that may sound, would think. Right? You understand that the idea of committing a burglary and then as you leave, hot wiring a car in the driveway to get away is simply preposterous. Rebecca Fenton didn't see that. It gets worse. We find out that the gun used to kill Larry was Larry's gun using Larry's ammunition from in the house, right? According to Rebecca, Larry kept the gun in a drawer. So we are to believe that the alleged burglar shows up to a house with at least one adult in the main house without a weapon on Super Bowl Sunday to rob the house. And, of course, this burglar doesn't have transportation to leave the crime scene. Let's ask some basic questions here. How would the burglar know where Larry's gun is? If Larry is in the living room, which is adjacent to the front door, how much time would it take the burglar to get past Larry and to search the house, hoping to find a weapon. Which burglar would stick around the house at all if an adult male is in the living room? Other things don't add up. Someone took great pains to make this look like a burglary, including going through the upstairs bedrooms and pulling out some drawers. Yet, Larry had a wallet on him. And that wallet had cash in it. The burglar did not take Larry's wallet. Kills Larry. Larry's dead, folks. Doesn't reach over and take Larry's wallet. Isn't that something you would expect burglars to do? 
right? If the killer goes to the trouble of killing Larry, why wouldn't the killer take the cash out of Larry's wallet? Isn't that one of the first things the killer would think of if they're in the house to steal things? Now let's pause for a moment here and let's think like empathetic people if a burglar can be considered empathetic. Now let's say you're the burglar and you've broken into this house where there's an adult male in the living room and you decide to stick around without a weapon and without transportation to rob the place. Right? Let's say you somehow find the weapon and the adult male tries to run out the door. Why would you use the weapon? Don't you already have protection? What's the adult male going to do when you have a loaded gun? If the adult male threatened you and came at you, and Larry shot in the back, folks, not in the front, wouldn't you pull out the gun and say, hey, get out of my way? Stand over there and no one gets hurt. And wouldn't you walk out of the place? Right? The logistics here are off. The burglar somehow has Larry's gun. There's no sign of a struggle. Right? The burglar has Larry's gun. Larry is unarmed. Larry is running away. Why would the burglar choose to use the gun? at all. Not only that, you're doing a burglary. You don't want gunshots to echo through the neighborhood. Don't you want to do the burglary as silently as possible? Why would the burglar use the gun at all once the burglar came upon the gun? Let's continue. At some point in all of this, you go upstairs and you pull out drawers in the bedroom. Right now, we all understand that going upstairs is perilous for any burglar. Right? It's bad enough this burglar shows up, doesn't have a weapon, apparently has no transportation away from the crime scene. The minute you go up a flight of stairs, in a house that you don't know. Couldn't the homeowner then trap you upstairs? Because you have to come down the stairs to leave the upstairs portion of the house. Here, we're to believe that a burglar shows up in an occupied house and goes upstairs and then is looking through the drawers upstairs. I don't think Rebecca Fenton fully understood the low possibility of that. Now, let me just say that this crime has a further wrinkle. When does it cross the burglar's mind? If you believe it ever does. To try to frame somebody else for the murder. You would think enough's going on here, right? The burglar shows up, adult in the living room. Uh, the burglar somehow gets the gun. The burglar somehow goes upstairs. The burglar somehow comes back downstairs. Homeowner is trying to run out the house. The burglar somehow is behind the homeowner, uh, shoots him from behind. At what point in all of this, does there come a time where the burglar then thinks to himself, I'm going to frame somebody else for this, and I'm going to do this right now while I'm committing this burglary? I think for most people, we understand that just wouldn't happen. Rebecca Fenton might have thought differently. If she thought this thing through. She may not have. 
She may have done this crime and been somewhat unprepared. Understand, there comes a time here, according to the evidence, if a burglar existed, that the burglar decides he's going to frame Rebecca Fenton for the crime if he knows she exists. Right? Just understand. The burglar decides he's going to put the murder weapon in a bag that he's going to place under the front seat of Rebecca Fenton's car. Right? If the burglar simply wanted to leave the gun in the house, he could have just dropped the gun by Larry Fenton's body. That's not what he does. Instead, we're to believe that he takes the gun out of the house, takes the time to put the gun in a bag that he apparently found, then opens up Rebecca Fenton's car and puts the gun under the front seat. Now this might be a plausible story to a psychopath who has planned and is now trying to cover up the crime. I don't believe that psychopaths understand that this is simply not something that people would do. If a burglar panics and kills the occupant of a house they were burglarizing, I believe they would want to leave the premises as soon as possible. Not stick around and plant the murder weapon someplace. I don't believe they would think to put the gun in a bag. Why would you? And then to place that bag in the car of the wife of the murder victim, or in the second car that's in the driveway. That doesn't make sense to me. Now, psychopaths tend to be self-centered and narcissistic. They are thinking primarily only about themselves, and they believe they are the smartest person in the room. I believe that it's a distinct possibility that Rebecca Fenton, in trying to cover up her tracks, decided to place the gun in a bag and to put the murder weapon in her car, which was outside of the house, thinking that the cops would never look in her car and would never find the gun. This is the kind of sick thinking that a psychopath would have. Let's recognize that this crime is so thought out that the gun doesn't have any fingerprints on it. This is not a case of a burglar simply panicking, finding a gun in the house, having a struggle with Larry, and then shooting Larry four times in the back area. Right? This isn't a case where Larry hears a noise he doesn't understand. He reaches for a gun. There's a struggle. The burglar, the intruder, gets the gun from Larry, shoots Larry, and then puts the stuff that he's grabbed from upstairs in a bag and leaves, taking Larry's car. We know neither of those two scenarios happen because the gun has no prints on it. Let's say the burglar is wearing gloves. Understand the gun doesn't even have Larry's prints on it. Right? This is a clean gun that comes from the victim's house. I believe Rebecca Fenton overthought that part. Right? Didn't think to have prints on the gun, even Larry's prints on the gun. Viewers should know, too, that the keys to Larry's gun case, as well as the keys to Larry's stolen Jeep, were found in Rebecca's car. Right? Think about it. 
We are to believe that the burglar planted a lot of things in Rebecca's car, including the keys to the car that the burglar allegedly stole. Now, Larry's car, which we are supposed to believe was stolen by the burglar, is found about one and a half blocks from the crime scene. So we're to believe the burglar puts the stuff they're stealing from the car, right? Because some of the supposed stolen items are found in Larry's car. Drives Larry's car a block and a half away. And then decides for whatever reason to walk back to the crime scene with Larry's car keys. Is this believable to you? Understand, if a neighbor knew that a burglary was taking place and called the cops, if anyone called the cops, if there was somebody else in the house, and there was, Rebecca Fenton, who called the cops, wouldn't a burglar who is hanging around the scene of the burglary with the car keys for the car that was stolen, who's actually returning to the scene of the crime, to plant the keys in Rebecca's car, wouldn't that burglar be out of his mind? So let me point out too that when Larry's car is found by the police one and a half blocks away from the murder scene, and I don't think Rebecca thought it would be discovered. In her warped thinking, she thought when the cops came, they would believe her. They wouldn't even check her car right outside the house. They wouldn't check a block and a half away for the alleged stolen car, which had the stolen items in it. I believe Rebecca, who's smarter than everyone else in her mind, thought she was going to convince the cops that her husband was killed by an intruder and then I think she thought the cops would go looking for the intruder. Not listening closely, looking at forensics, looking through her car, looking around the neighborhood and finding the stolen car. So let's summarize this peculiar evidence. Tell me if you think this is believable. The alleged intruder steals Larry's car after killing him in the commission of a burglary, that intruder then drives the car a block and a half away, leaves the valuable items in the car before returning to the murder scene to leave the keys in Larry's car, uh, to Larry's car, in Rebecca Fenton's car, where, of course, the murder weapon has also been left. Does that make sense to you? I believe a clear-thinking person wouldn't have made the mistakes in staging this scene that Rebecca Fenton made, right? Rebecca Fenton is well presented as she is on the Pierce Morgan show, is in the proper place, and that's in prison, because she's a psychopath who wasn't thinking clearly enough when she decided to plan and execute this murder, right? She can prepare years after this murder. She can prepare for the questions and look good on a TV show. But left to her own devices off camera in a spontaneous situation, I believe she gets in trouble. Her psychopathy and emotional detachment are evident in the fact that when the cops arrived at the house shortly after her husband, who she supposedly did not know was dead, laid in a pool of blood right by the front door. Understand, during her exchange with the cops who show up and find a dead body, Rebecca started smiling and laughing with them. 
they notice the improper emotional affect. Rebecca could not fake her emotional detachment during this traumatic time. She admits that she laughed and joked with the police and simply says that she has no explanation as to why she reacted that way. What would Rebecca's motive have been for killing Larry? You know, she sounds great saying, look, he was financially providing for us. Why would I kill the golden goose? Just understand that there was a life insurance policy. Rebecca was in a position to receive $500,000 under the policy in the event that Larry was killed by someone else. Understand, too, that the $500,000 was more money than Rebecca would have received in a divorce because she had signed a premarital agreement. Right? So, just looking at the facts of this case, I believe the court system got this one right. Rebecca Fenton killed her husband, wore gloves, used a gun from inside of the house. In staging the burglary, she forgot to take the cash out of her husband's wallet. She drove his Jeep a block and a half away and then put the keys to the Jeep in her car with the gun she used to kill her husband and was self-involved enough to not realize that she would be a suspect and that her car would be searched by police. Let me add that there are certain times of the year when you know there are going to be some people at home. Christmas morning is one of them. Another is Super Bowl Sunday. I find it simply not believable that a burglar would target Super Bowl Sunday to rob a house in which an adult male is in the living room watching the Super Bowl pregame. Keep in mind, before the burglar got in the house, the burglar would have to see the cars in the driveway. Add in the fact that the burglar did not have a gun and may not have had a way to leave the scene of the crime, and you have a scenario that only a psychopath who thought she was the smartest person in the room would come up with. I'm grateful that Rebecca Fenton lacked the emotional connection and intelligence to understand that her story of taking her husband's pulse, not knowing whether he was alive, and then deciding to go upstairs to see if any property had been stolen before calling 911 is simply not a credible story. It was Rebecca Fenton's psychopathy that got her caught. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you in the comment section of this YouTube video. Now that she has had several years to practice her delivery and to review the facts of her story, Rebecca Fenton comes across well in interviews with ready-made explanations. In my opinion, it is all an act by a psychopath who doesn't fully understand the trail of evidence that she has left behind. I look forward to your comments. Thanks for stopping by.